Hi, welcome to Common Sense Ethics. My name is Leah. My guest today is Dan Dimitriou. Did I pronounce it right? Sure, Dimitriou. Dimitriou. Uh, okay. Okay. And um, Dan, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? And thank you very much for coming on, by the way. Oh, thank you for having me, Leah. Uh, my name is Dan Dimitriou. Um, I am an associate professor of uh, philosophy at the University of Minnesota, Morris. Morris is sort of the liberal arts campus of the mm -hmm. Minnesota system. Yes, yeah. it was supposed to be a sort of public liberal arts answer to um, sort of yeah. elite small liberal arts schools that are usually almost always private. And yeah. um, it actually does accomplish that task pretty well. So. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been I've been teaching there since I graduated from uh, my got my PhD at University of Colorado in 2009. I teach uh, ethics, and social political philosophy type classes. I teach philosophy of law. Um, I teach a class on love and sex that we'll talk about a little bit today, I think. Um, political philosophy, stuff like that. Yeah, and um, our topic today is, uh, you know, based on your work is going to be sort of uh, the ethics of sex and guns. <laughs> a yeah, provocative title. Good. Provocative yeah. title. <laughs> now that you um, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I really enjoyed reading your work because um, each piece contained what I thought were sort of novel arguments, at least for me, things that I'd not heard argued before that I thought worked really well um, and were new and interesting for me. And uh, some of the most more fascinating subjects that you've written on were sort of the ethics of sexuality and also self-defense. And so those are going to be the subject of our interview today. So for the first part, we're going to talk about um, sexual ethics, which, like you said, is one of your areas of specialization. And, you know, just to introduce the, the topic, um, you know, some some people might think, well, why study that? You know, shouldn't we not have opinions on sort of uh, the consensual sexual practices of other people. And, um, you know, I thought that in your, your first piece on monogamy, um, which we'll talk about in more detail, uh, you mentioned, um, where well, you cited a quote by evolutionary psychologist, uh, Jeffrey Miller. And I thought he make, made a really good case for why, you know, we should sort of study this area. Um, so I'm gonna read the quote. Uh, so he writes that sexual relationships can impose good and bad side effects, positive and negative externalities on children, communities, uh, economies, um, civilizations, and future generations. And so mating markets matter, sexual ethics matter, uh, reproductive choices matter, families matter. That is why we've evol evolved instincts to stick our noses into other people's sex lives. <laughs> <laughs> and um, why human sexuality has often been the most controversial domain in human politics and religion. So I thought that's really interesting. I often find myself agreeing with, um, you know, evolutionary psychologists about a lot of things. Um, and, you know, also I would say, you know, it's an important area to study because it's also probably one of the areas with the greatest temptation. So naturally there would be a lot of ethical issues that arise from that. So um, I thought that that was a really interesting way to sort of introduce the topic. And these are some of the things we're gonna to touch on today in the interview. And I'll circle back and ask you more about your monogamy piece uh, in a bit. So you mentioned in your writing that your experience with teaching um, sexual ethics has been particularly fraught. <laughs> because of the sexual unhappiness of the majority of your students. Can you explain what you meant by that and you know why that might be the case? Because I was curious when I was reading. Yeah. You know, what um, you meant. Well, we, we know empirically uh, that uh, sexlessness is on the rise among young people. Right. Um, which is not necessarily bad. Like I don't look at this. this so for instance, there are these stats that the average uh, age of first intercourse has uh, gone up yeah. and so forth. Um, and that something like, while well, this was 2018, something like 28% of young men are, are essentially sexless at this point. It's probably more like one third now, uh, post COVID, yeah. maybe even higher. And um, all right, um, 
And then um, girls um, who have an easier time getting sex, there's some evidence that uh, rates of sexlessness among girls is also going up. Right. Um, and um, that the girls who are engaging in sex are not particularly uh, strengthened by the process. So there's right. like evidence right. that um, girls actually become more angry and hostile to uh, towards mm -hmm. like hookup culture and so forth the longer they're in it like if it was beneficial they'd be more like positive about it but no they tend to right, 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 angry right, about right, it. right and right. and there's just this sort of predatory you know and the men know this there's a sort of predatory aspect to it that the right. the freshmen coming in are sort of fresh meat you know and and so right, yeah. so girls when they're graduating <laughs> college are more skeptical yeah. of hookup culture than the freshmen mm. who are coming in Right. And because uh, they're being kind of chewed up by that, um, there's a lot of unhappiness around um, sexual experiences because, well, I mean, we know that like there's all this evidence that women have better sexual experiences when they're with long term partners. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, they have they orgasm more frequently and have less painful sex when they're in a long term relationship as opposed to hookups. So yeah. girls, you know, engaged in hookup culture are also just having negative, a lot of negative sexual experiences. Uh, there's um, a lot of regret around it. Uh, to some degree, yeah. that regret is is fueling a lot of unhappiness in college as far as like rape culture, which isn't always really rape, but really girls sort right, of reacting yeah. to uh, bad decisions they made, um, and yeah. and then feeling. Well, yeah, I suppose. It, yeah, it could be that, and it could there could sometimes be like actual rape too. <laughs> There's ab there yeah, absolutely right. Is, yeah, yep. like uh, when your so, alcohol is involved, and God knows. You know. Yep. So um, there's uh, there's uh, pernicious sex imbalance at uh, colleges where it's like mm. sixty percent women and forty percent men. This is a big problem because right. uh, it creates huh. it creates a situation in which the um, the the girls to get male attention have to accommodate male um, sex strategies, right? So the male, the, the since the boys prefer, so it isn't just like sixty percent of the girls are trying to have sex with forty percent right, right. of the boys. It's even worse, like because right, right, you have, I mean, just take the heterosexual population. You have uh, sixty percent of the heterosexual population kind of having trying trying to get the attention of basically 20 percent <laughs> because the you know women yeah. are had pergamous they're only looking for the best guys and you know there are a lot of kind of hopeless boys at college too so really the the top half of the boys well they're, they're only going to be 20 percent yeah. of the college population so so those boys have a lot of sexual opportunity and because of that uh they're disinclined to get into relationships and committed relationships when they don't need to when they could have more sexual variety and and have sex with less commitment and financial outlays, et cetera. So so the girls are having to because of this sex ratio that we set up. The girls are having to um, have sex more often and uh, earlier in a relationship than they otherwise would if right. they had the way. Whereas uh, this dynamic is sort of shift. This dynamic is sort of. Uh, Flipped right. uh, in 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 say engineering schools where it's like seventy percent men and thirty percent right 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 <laughs> yeah so like uh, I would like to send my daughter to an engineering school <laughs> so that she has you know she has the ability to to have things her way more often so that, um, that ratio is that that sixty to forty that has that has gotten worse in the last probably twenty years right because oh, yeah, there's now a lot more because I it seemed about equal. You know, I, I was in college about 20 years ago, and so I think it seemed like there were probably equal numbers of men and women then, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so, I forget when it happened, but it pro right. I, I think it's it did recent. happen sometime in the 90s, okay. late 90s. Oh, so well, probably, well, see. Probably just nailing it, yeah. Well, I don't, yeah, maybe, hmm, I don't know. Well, so, yeah, I started college in 99. I, I don't know. I, that's just anecdotal mm -hmm. for me. But so the, the women are hypergamous argument, is that? I'm not a, I, I suppose I accept that probably from an, an evolutionary perspective, but I struggle with that a bit. Well, yeah, so there's there might be evolutionary reasons for that. Is that what you think? Yeah, I mean, it's observed. Um, yeah. So so the claim 
is could be established by just observation that um, em empirically that right. women do prefer to uh, mate across or higher if they can. Right. Um, women on dating apps express interest in men who make more money than them, et cetera, than they do, you know, and so but you're thinking that that might be good for your your future children. <laughs> Is that yeah, right? Is that the, that's the yeah, so yeah. so. Uh, uh, you know, women are more interested than men are in provisioning, you know, the ability yeah. of the mate to provision. And um, they are, um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, the, you know, the, these things keep coming up, um, not just provisioning, but also for long, when it comes to long-term mates, interest in, um, actually providing so so it isn't just right. that they want to get with a, a, a guy who has more money than they do but they want some sort of right. signs that he is going to channel that money to them and so you know mm -hmm. that all sorts of all sorts of either all sorts of um well signals high cost signals that you can get to achieve that like will he pay on a date will he hold my hand in public um right. will he do silly things that um show show people <laughs> widely around that that he's interested in me and that you know to stay yeah. away and stuff like that so um um but you know for short-term mating there's a different set of things that women tend to be interested in right uh, you know so as as you might know from that you know david bus literature and stuff like that that you know the more more of a good genes orientation where it's you know you're mm. looking for sexy traits or genes, you know, uh, good genes that you could pass on to your child who will then right. also be attractive on the mating market. Um, right, right, right. So, hmm. you know, look, that's where, you know, things like height, um, a nice body, um, a good sense of humor, things like that matter. Yeah. Uh, perhaps more. And of course, you know, men, you know, I tell my students that they should try to be as good as they can on both scales, um, especially today. Uh, right. So, um, but yeah, so uh, hypergamy. Yeah, hypergamy is real. M males, uh, women have to be selective sure. about who they have sex with um, because they they are left holding the bag if if she gets pregnant more than the male is. Right, right, yeah. And so uh, yeah. Uh, males, males are just very unselective. And, you know, they have, I mean, you know, there are these rude terms, you know, like guys will proudly talk about some some girl they're having sex with you know and they'll have the meanest terms for them you know call them slam pigs and stuff like <laughs> this. Like, like they're absolutely they hold yeah. these girls in yeah contempt. yeah, yeah that's they're, terrible yeah you don't think they're yeah. high quality women they don't think right, they're right, even right, genetically right. quality right. but but you'd you know, ask what does that say about you if you're you know willing to go there then so <laughs> but, <laughs> oh my goodness that's funny <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. so yeah so because of this because of this it's even worse on campus and um mm -hmm. so the 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 top say 50 percent of guys in college are doing pretty well and and this doesn't end at college right they graduate college mm. and then women in the mating market tend to uh have a positive valence for guys who are college graduates right especially if if she has gone to college right she you know women a lot of women right. uh perhaps very mistakenly think that um, a college degree is a is an important you know status indicator for them and so forth and they don't yeah. want to, they think they're going to be marrying down or something like that if they marry a guy who 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 didn't go to college when they went to college right and so um so the college guys uh continue to do well because you know non-college educated women also prefer them and so it's it just uh it's hmm. really uh it, it just never stops and so right. yeah that 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 bleeds into That's this a, sort yeah. of virgin versus chad dynamic right uh where you kind of it, it's increasingly looking like the incels were right that there is a sort of winner takes all dynamic on the male side when uh monogamy norms break down right right and we'll circle back to that but first i want to ask you about your um you said you're writing and presenting on something that you call sexual creepiness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's hilarious. So, now, philosophers are all about defining terms. So what, what are you, what is your definition of sexual creepiness and what do you, what conclusions do you draw about it? 
Yeah, I did a... read the, or I did see your video. But oh, yeah, yeah. So I, I, uh, I have a little video up of a GW, uh, Gender Women's and Sexuality Studies uh, Works in Progress talk on that issue, uh, which is unlike most GWSS talks, let's put it like that. But um, yeah, so uh, very little has been written on sexual creepiness and philosophy <laughs> and, and even creepiness and philosophy. Right. So, so it's kind of wide open. And surprisingly, not much has been written on creepiness in psychology. But um, um, the psychologists, uh, um, McAndrews and uh, McAndrew and um, his collaborator, uh, Konki, uh, wrote a kind of breakthrough paper in 2015 or 16, I forget what, called, uh, you know, on creepiness. It's just, and it's really good. And they just look at, um, well, you know, what sort of, I mean, I think it's international, it has a nice, uh, it has a lot of subjects, um, but they look at like, well, what sort of occupations do people think are creepy? They're not looking just at sexual creepiness. This is creepiness in general. Mm -hmm. What occupations, what hobbies, what looks, <laughs> um, what behaviors, right? I mean, you said taxidermy, right? <laughs> yeah. Tax yeah, taxidermy is high up there. Um, and like other hobbies, like um, anything that has to do with collecting, there's, you know, like <laughs> collecting type hobbies and hobbies that involve even watching, like even bird watching came off as more. I, I, that's kind of, so strange. I don't think bird watching is creepy. It, I, and doesn't it depend like what you're collecting? Right, like some yeah. things will be good to collect. Like, what about cars? Like men who lo collect cars right. and things like that. Yeah. That's not creepy. Sure, right? sure. I, I, right. I agree. I agree. But um, I just you know <laughs> these are just you know it has right. a lot That's to do just with what, what people think. Right. One of, like one of the things they ask is like yeah. there. I guess there are people that like collect teeth that fall out or nail toenails. Well, that okay. Stuff, like, Fair enough. That's creepy. But but I don't know. So, not so, bird watching though. What's wrong with bird watching? Well, <laughs> I I I I bet. I bet bird watching comes off as a little creepier um, when I put myself in in the type in in the demographic of the person who's likely to make creepiness accusations, which is interestingly mm. uh, young women. Uh, like I almost never use the word creepy. I never like. I don't say either. Creepy. Yeah. Yeah. But some people like have are are very sort of creepiness prone, and and demographically tends to be young women, and that actually turns out to be pretty important. But um, when I put myself in, when I put my young woman's hat on, um, yeah, I could see like a, you know, a guy with like some binoculars, you know, a little nerdy with binoculars, all, you know, all, all things being equal, like that versus, um, you know, that, that versus a guy who runs yeah. or something like that. Right. Um, you know, it's just like, well, okay, he's looking at a bird, sure, but you know, then you know, he's more likely to look in a girl's window or something like that too. He's yeah, like, all right, all right. I can see. anything yeah. that is triggering this sort of predatory, um, um, right? I can, I can, I can, thing. Yeah, I can see that. I just, I, it's never a connection that I would ever have drawn myself, but um. Yeah, I know that, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead, but I remember you said in your video that some of the things that are considered like sexually creepy are long fingernails yeah. and. <laughs> yeah, and that, yeah, that's one thing they say, right? So, so like when it comes to physical features, yeah. things like yeah. being tall and skinny, mm -hmm. having really white skin, having long <laughs> fingers, having long fingernails, um, yeah. having unkempt or greasy hair, uh, you know, so yeah. now, all right, some of these are behaviors like long, right. like you, you could wash your hair, um, right, right, right. you could cut your nails. So that may be viewed as like actually a behavior. But some of the things are people are things people can't change, like being tall, tall or um, yeah, and yeah. having long fingers. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, um, it's uh, and and so anyway, like they roll this stuff out. It's all very interesting. And they give this analysis looking at all the different sort of triggers, common triggers of, of accusations of being creepy. They say, well, look, they analyze creepiness as creepiness in general, again, 
as sort of ambiguous threateningness. So you're ambiguously mm -hmm. a threat. Right, right, right. So if you're right. like straight out, if you're like it, like so, so a guy who's even like saying like I want to rape you and is coming at you is like less creepy, right? Because that's not an ambiguous threat. Right, like, right, it's, right, it's right. It's that it's like you can't tell. Um, yeah, right. that, that uncanny uh, sort of uncanny valley of threateningness right? and so which uh, you know is another big type of analysis for creepiness is uh, the uncanny the, the not being not falling squarely within our categories type uh, that feeling uh, tends to be right. so um, but I think there I think uh, you know McAndrew is right that it's it is uh, it, it has this threat element so all right so if let's go with this if creepiness is uh ambiguous threateningness then sexual like you know the the first place to go is to say sexual creepiness is being a uh ambiguous sexual threat you know and so you know right. like let's let's start with that and so like a philosopher would want to know okay so is 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 sexual creepiness then the feeling of that and you know i i think that that's probably not the way to go you'd probably want to say it is the elicitors it's 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 the it's the common elicitors of that feeling something like that right. so you you'd want to identify sexual creepiness with whatever sorts of behaviors or looks or whatever you know tend to elicit that that and right. um and uh, what, okay so you yeah. know that's step one yeah I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I was just going to say when I was I, from I, from what I've read about sort of victimology, which is not a lot, but from what I've read about it, it's like the someone who look. It's more behavioral that that someone's behavior. Maybe it probably people have a prejudice against people who look a certain way. You know, who is sort of a ambiguous threat. But from my understanding, it's actually more their behavior that will give you subtle clues as to what they're up. You know, what they're what they're about. Do you know what I mean? Like sort of things like forced teaming. You know, like, let me help you, you know, mm -hmm. overly pushy. I don't remember if you touched on that or not. Someone sort of touching you without your permission. I think you you did mention that um, sort of cornering, you know, sort of things like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. That are, you know, might not be the guy with the little greasy hair, you know, or it right. might be, but it's more. Right. Yeah. So 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 common behavior, like some some examples of behaviors that uh, seemed really creepy are talking about sex too early. Yeah. Again, you could all see this from a young woman's perspective. Like it's hard, like most guys are not like, oh, she's creepy. She's talking about sex too early. Like, you know, I mean, right, they'll, they'll right, have right, other, right, right, they'll right, have right, other right. responses, right. but it won't be. <laughs> but um, <laughs> so talking about sex too early, anything that is cornering, um, right. touching. Um, um, so yeah, there, there definitely are, uh, or staring across the room for a long time before you talk to the person. <laughs> <laughs> um so so, so these, you're laughing at, you you like i find this stuff to be grimly humorous right um, <laughs> it, 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 it is it, yeah. I, yeah yeah i i do approach <sighs> it with a certain sort you know maybe i maybe i should be more sober-minded about it and take it to but i do i do find this to be somewhat amusing in, in kind of this horrific way but yeah uh so yeah those are some behaviors uh, uh, around creepiness right um but what gets really interesting is that there's this, there are a whole bunch of features that are not at all, that don't seem to have much to do at all with threat that mm -hmm. are getting men called creepy. And that's where some criticism right, of, right, 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 of right, right, creepiness right. have come in. So this right, right. legal scholar, uh, Heidi Matthews wrote this viral piece that I like a lot called, you know, or something like the problem of creepy men or what to do with the problem of creepy men or something like that. And what Heidi Matthews says is, look, I mean, what what she does is what some philosophers should have done a long time ago, frankly. And she she wrote this in, I think, 2019. But what she says is, you know, she just goes over some of the literature. Right. Um, which also kind of shows like like there was this one laboratory experiment that you know just showed w young women this was just young women i think were the subjects but 
showed young women pictures of like normal guys and then guys on America's Most Wanted. Like, okay. <laughs> and they try, you know, they're all the same race. Right, right, right. And, right. you know, they're trying to like normalize it so you can't. And, um, and girls were just not good at all about identifying who were the guys on America's Most Wanted. Right. That, that's, I remember, the, but that's been, you said that's because it's in situ. It's, it's not in situ. A lot of the threatening things are behavioral and it's, it might even be, uh, it might even be like um, subliminal. Do you, or is that that's not maybe that's not the right word, but like it's, unconscious. Yeah, yeah. Right, like or the, you know, like from sort of an evolutionary perspective, you've evolved to recognize threats in the environment, and this it's not really a it's not really like a neocortex like function. Right. Do you know what I mean? And it's, I do. Right. So of course you can't really identify by looking at a picture of somebody, like. Yeah. Everything I've read about victimology contradicts that as a good basis for, you know. Yeah, I I, I agree. Um, it, it'd be really hard to study how good this so-called, you know, threat detecting uh, thing is going on. But um, nonetheless, there are a lot of like dudes being called creepy that aren't displaying those sorts of behaviors. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of accusations of creepiness of people who aren't even involved with you in any way. <laughs> like, so for instance, right. like, right. If, right, uh, right, right. if a 60 year old uh, millionaire is, um, you know, goes on the red carpet with a 20 year old, uh, you know, uh, girlfriend or even wife, okay. Um, you know, that that guy is called creepy very often. And obviously his date doesn't see him as creepy, you know, or, you yeah. know, I mean, if she married, you know, whatever there. Right. Or um, and there was like this attempt to to call Leonardo DiCaprio creepy because he keeps, you know, dating women between 20 and 24 and so forth and then breaks up with them at 24. And there was this kind of campaign to try to make him mm. creepy. And it's just like, like Jack Nicholson did that, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, Leonardo DiCaprio is uh, this generation's Jack Nicholson or uh -huh. whatever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, um, it it seems to me like, um, and it it seems to to well, Ma Matthews Matthews's complaint is right because uh, I think she's also maybe more skeptical of threat detection than you or I, um, am. But, but um, right. her brief is look, um, basically what you're doing here is not being sex positive, right? You are um, taking weird looking people and yeah. and stigmatizing them. Um, you're stigmatizing, and, and so for our, our, our like guys with Tourette's more likely to be called creepy, yes. Are homeless people, guys more likely to be called creepy, yes. Um, are people with strange sexual tastes, which Matthews thinks we should accept, right? As long as they're channeling it into, mm -hmm. uh, consensual relationships mm -hmm. uh creepy yeah those guys are being called creepy more often um so uh po polyamorous guys are being called mm -hmm. creepy more often and you know so she you know because she's sort of taking this progressive liberal uh, approach towards sex ethics she's like um you know this this isn't this isn't coming up to progressive or liberal sex ethical standards and we we have to stop it like we have you know we shouldn't be just embracing right, right 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 um so that's fun and then you know so so um i in this paper what i try to do is what what i'm what, what i'm trying to do in the paper and as i develop the view is say well what can what can like the liberal or progressive say in defense of of this um, and, you know, I, I want to give an explanation because one of the things that we haven't talked about yet is that like, if you go on Google Ngram and put in creepy, creepy, like there's like this huge spike starting in the nineties, eighties, nineties of, of, of use of the term. And I don't think they're talking about haunted houses. Okay. I think that they're talking about sexual creepiness. So, so, um, there seems to be this, you know, increase of, yeah. people making accusations about sexual creepiness and uh but it, it, it seems to cut across the sort of liberal progressive sex ethic view which is increasingly like the default sex ethic you know what's yeah. going on here and um 
So from there, I give a sort of psychological hypothesis. It's really a psycho. It's really psychological or sociological hypothesis. It's not really doing philosophy, um, but uh, so I can't really test it. Uh, someone yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that stuff should test it. But my claim is um, that we need to distinguish between sexual creepiness as a moral category and the way we wield that category. All right, right. so yeah, 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 yeah. Th these two things could be different. Like, um, like, like take a, take a moral category we all agree is okay, like um, injustice. Right. I mean, who among us are going to say, oh, that's a suspect category. Like everyone is cool with justice. Everyone doesn't like injustice. We just debate what constitutes it, but we're right, all okay yeah. with the category. Right. Um, but if there were like if young women just so happened to never use the term injustice about good looking guys, <laughs> you know, if they only used it to goofy looking guys or guys with unkempt hair or long fingernails or whatever, or if they only used it for men of a certain race, right? And that's the only time they use this word injustice. We'd be like, look, maybe we're cool with injustice and all, but there's this interesting question about how you're wielding this term injustice, right? And that is what we're going to call into question. Right. right. So um, that's what I that's what I'm trying to say. Like, OK, let's let sexual let's set sexual creepiness aside. Let's think about how it's being wielded because uh, it, it, it is probably being weaponized in some way. A lot of guys feel like it's being weaponized. A lot of guys feel like it's being done unfairly. Like, hey, I've, I'm, I'm not displaying any of the behaviors that are, are supposed to be creepy. Um, I'm, right. I'm, I even cut my fingernails. I'm just not that good looking, you know, and I'm yeah, being that, called yeah. creepy. Um, right, that's the idea. You know, or I'm, I'm sorry, right. like I have, you know, I don't have great facial symmetry and maybe my one eye, you know, hangs down a little bit and, you know, you're <laughs> calling me creepy. And, or, you know, um, I talk to, a, I, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, hit on a girl who's 20 years younger than me, but I didn't do anything like, you know, other than that, you know, or so, so and don't call me creepy or whatever. So this is, this leads to, so if we make that distinction between how the category, you know, how the category is being used for accusations from the category itself, then it looks to me like what's going on is um, a couple factors. I think that there's been this breakdown of traditional sexual norms that protected young women. Uh, but if I could just add one last thing about the sexual creepiness topic before we leave it is that um, I don't want I don't want your viewers to think like I'm a skeptic about s sexual creepiness. Um, that anytime women make an accusation of sexual creepiness, I think it's oh just because it's because he's not attractive or whatever. Um, I I don't know what you think about this. Um, and I, of course, like I, I, my views are colored by just getting older and and viewing things maybe more from a, a woman's perspective than I did what could when I was young. But I I do actually think that men are getting creepier. You know I. I wouldn't know, because like I said, I've been married for over 10 years and partnered for more than 15. So I don't know. But um, but I would say it's probably a bit of both. Like there are, there definitely are creepy behaviors and they don't always correlate, I think, with someone looking creepy. So there's that. But it's on the other hand, it is sad for people to throw that term about too casually. You know, I, I would say both are true. Yeah, both yeah, I definitely think it shouldn't be thrown around casually. Um, it is it is harmful to the target, um, especially if he's a good dude. Um, so um, but I do think that guys are getting creepier. Like you'll you'll hear this a lot in women's forums like female dating strategy. Uh, there's a lot of like love after porn type re subreddits and stuff like that where women are talking about porn sick men and whatever. But um, I do think that 
mass consumption of pornography is making a certain sort of guy who is not having yeah. actual sex with girls, consuming a lot of porn, making them more... It, I, I see more of this sort of like reptilian predatoriness or reptilian sort of approach towards sex um, among guys. I do think that sexlessness, and if you go to countries that are polygamous um, and have guys who are like not, have have no experience with women, yeah, um, or at least none that hasn't been bought, um, it, it does distort their abilities to connect with women, to have conversations yeah. with women and so forth. And as our culture, be, as our culture becomes one in which you have a higher proportion of sexless men, you are getting guys that never learn those sort of social graces or just, you know, uh, understand less and less cross sex, you know, um, you know, psychology. Right. Um, I went to a Bible college and, um, at, at my Bible college, there was a big emphasis on us dating. Um, right. We were actually like told by administrators, we'd be kind of browbeaten, like, why aren't you asking these girls out on our dates? And and these are non-sexual <laughs> dates, right? These are non-sexual right. dates. Right, right, right. Um, you know, you go to the zoo, you go to the Rose Garden or whatever, and um, oftentimes in groups, you know, a lot of picnics, cheap, whatever. And... Um, more times than not, my dates would be girls I wasn't even particularly interested in romantically, right? Right. And, but all of us, like really all of us, even guys who were somewhat, you know, clumsy, um, had, a, the, and it was kind of, so the idea was that it was kind of expected that the girl would say yes, right? Um, if you asked her out for a date, if she didn't have a date. Um, so because in any way, a lot of girls were on dates. And so the girls oftentimes want to be left out anyway. So anyway, and again, it's not there's like zero, zero probability of any sort of sex or any kissing or anything like that. Um, so the girls felt safe, etc. And uh, that sounds just, very nice. And uh, it quaint. was yeah. so yeah. nice. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 through that process, I you know we all got a lot of experience just talking to girls, right? Right. And just making conversations with girls, understanding how they think. Oh, we also had a lot of dances. All right. Yeah. And you know, with too. an expectation yeah. that you would have a date for the dance, and the sex ratio was correct. So you got experience um, putting your hands on a girl right hand on hip and and a hand, we didn't do the the two hands on a hip wobble we had the one hand on hip <laughs> one hand on her hand well you know but you got it, these kids even though like a lot of them were virgins even mo vast yeah. majority of them virgins had um experience literally and, and you dan dance with a lot of different girls at the dance even at the same dance and you know you just got that sort of experience of touching a a, a, a woman and um this stuff is so beneficial to getting rid of creepiness um yeah you know just because you know when when if you go to these incel forums you know what what they you know there's this phrase or what is it h k v you know hugless kissless virgin you right it matters to the guys, like, it isn't just that they're a virgin, like, they've never even kind of hugged a girl or kissed a girl. And um, it, yeah. it just starts at some point having a very distorting effect on their psychology, I think. And we're, we're seeing more and more of that because, like, um, yeah. there's there's less uh, social pressure to have uh, school dances, less pressure to go, there's less pressure against not having a date. So you have more and more boys just going alone, girls just going with groups and, and, uh, or boys not going at all. And so, um, these, these sorts of social graces that allow boys to talk to girls. And then you have this sort of weird thing going on on the guy side now where they don't want to be simps, which they view being a simp as being anyone who talks to a girl in any way that's not extractive. And so, um, you you have this dynamic, I think, where actually, yes, I do think that, and, and sometimes I just look at the students and I'm like, yeah, if I were a girl, I'd, I'd be totally creeped out by you, you know? Um, <laughs> and um, it isn't, uh, it, it isn't just, and it isn't just because like they're maybe dangerous or something like that, but just 
um, you just know it's going to be a negative, right? Non, utterly non-erotic experience. They don't really have an erotic sensibility that's been beat out of them too, uh, and so forth. And um, yeah. Well, so what? Uh, nothing is monocausal. So what do you think of? The, what do you think the reasons are for this? Like. You know, because like I, I didn't you didn't see this like 20 years ago or so, like when I was dating, at least not much, not as much. Right. Like and, and we're probably roughly the same age. Right. You said you got yep. your Ph.D. Yeah, in I'm 2009. 40, I'm 49. I'm 49. Oh, all right. Well, I'm 42. Well, similar yeah. ages anyway. But um, well, what do you think the reasons are for that? Like um, for the sort of. Uh, you know, sit, current situation. Uh, the creepiness stuff or the sexlessness stuff? And the, the sexlessness, this, yeah. This, yeah. The sexlessness. Um, all right. So uh, here's what you'll hear people say. We're still we're, there's there's no consensus about this, but I can I could give you a laundry list of not crazy things that people are saying out there who are really smart. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, male testosterone is on the decline. So right, there's yeah, less yeah. just sexual. Right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, and uh, I remember the first time that I have ever had, like, I remember the first time a, a, a boy in my class maybe has said that, oh, they're asexual. I was re really shocked. I was like kind of embarrassed from like, I can't believe you're saying that. And people from our generation would never admit that or whatever. But a lot of my students now are just openly asexual almost to the point where they're viewing it as this type of sexual orientation. It's a very interesting thing. But anyway, um, so testosterone is decreasing probably because of whatever microplastics or just not moving enough. Uh, we're, we're really yeah. on our devices and sitting so much. So we're not moving enough. Yeah. Um, we're getting fatter. All that stuff is antagonistic like towards- phytoestrogens in the right. food supply, like soy yep. and stuff like that. Yep. And, um, and also, uh, probably like there's some vitamin D deficiency connection mm. stuff like that. But anyway, testosterone rates are going Interesting. down. Interesting. And you definitely see like just this kind of grass eating male, like you see in Japan, this grass eating male, this sort of um, dynamic uh, appearing here more often of just not being interested. Yeah. All right. So, hey, if they're not interested, then of course that's going to increase, um, like that's going to decrease sexual um, activity. Uh, another thing is, uh, kids are drinking less. This is a, like a real, a real good reason. Kids are drinking less than our generation. That actually might be a good thing. <laughs> it might be a good thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. Except that the reason Ooh. they're drinking less is also because they're on more meds. Oh. Uh, so okay. That don't work well with their with, with drinking. So these okay. kids are on a you know they're they're a lot of them are on ADD drugs. A lot of them are on um, SSRIs. And the SSR, and here this leads to the third thing, like the, the meds that they're on increasingly are also bad for okay. uh, just, you know, or or they're on the pill or something like that, which is, you know, which oftentimes lowers um, sexual interest in women. Um, right. So you have those factors and um, increasing social anxiety. Um, I think that um, somehow there's this, we're doing something weird with our dopamine systems with cheap, easy dopamine, either through porn, video games, social media, scrolling, et cetera, that when when you screw up your dopamine receptors, it increases social anxiety for whatever reason. If you're socially anxious, then you're just more willing to have conversations over your phone, but you don't want to go out in real life. So there's more of that. Mm -hmm. um, so, so these are some reasons why... Um, and and uh, of course, another big one I think has to be pornography. Uh, I do subscribe to the view that uh, a lot of consumption of pornography is probably um, uh, sort of siphoning off some male sexual right. interest, and, and right, it's right, just right. it's just cheap. It's just you right. know it's, just yeah. we'll, we'll we'll take you know we'll often prepare a um, a less good meal if it's. You know, a meal that's we'll we'll take a meal that's fifty percent as good if it's uh, five percent as hard because that's just a good trade off, right? And likewise, you know, we'll they'll take a most people will take a sexual experience that's half as good if it takes almost no effort, which is what pornography does. So I do think that's um, part of it too. Um, and uh, so yeah, these are these are some I think of the factors that are going on in 
in the and 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 yeah. uh, and also just discouraged. So so the fact that yeah. a lot of guys think that through because of pornography and social media and various other sorts of memes and stuff, a lot of guys are under the impression that they're inadequate sexually or in you know and and that it's not even worth it that all the girls are just having sex with these top one percent guys, which is not true. But some no, it's not true. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it is. It yeah. is. There is evidence that. Uh, for the short-term mating, some the the top some a, a paper came out just I, I, f- I forget the name of it though. Um, but a yeah, paper I remember you this, cited it. No, no, I this is a new one since that paper. Oh. My paper came out that that suggested that um, no, it isn't just that the top twenty percent of guys are getting having more sex acts. This new one um, shows that the top guys are having more sex partners than they used to, so which is really important. So that 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 means that there is a, that the incels may be somewhat right that um, the top guys are getting more sex, but they're not. It's not. It's not. It's not like. Um, <clears throat> It's not all as bad as their fears uh, would, would suggest, and uh, it's not as out of reach for them as their fears would suggest. But you know, they get real hostile when you say that. You got to be, um, but yeah. uh, it, it's probably, if anything, kind of selecting for guys who are just continuing to put themselves out there and maybe less conscientious, whereas the incels are, you know, convinced that it's because of their right. jawline. Uh, right. Well, you said meeting meeting people on online. You had said that. That sort of if you meet someone online, and this is why I think some of this could be alleviated by not meeting as many people online and many people in real life is if someone's charismatic, you're not going to know that from a picture. You know, there's so much that you won't know from just seeing what someone looks like. You know, that tends to you just focus on their superficial qualities in that case. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. Guys who are guys who are tall. And ha- and know how to take a good picture and who are handsome in the face, um, right. body well, are doing right. really well now. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we, well, let's move on because uh, I want to get to part two. So let's. Uh, so you had mentioned your paper, provocatively titled "Virgin versus Chad on Enforced Monogamy as a Solution to the Incel Problem." <laughs> Now, that title is based on an equally provocative or more, more provocative thing that Jordan Peterson said about he used the unfortunate term enforced monogamy, which it's it's probably a poor choice of words. I don't know. Maybe that is what he meant. It's not really clear, but he seemed to have meant something more along the lines of normative monogamy, which if he used that term, probably most people would have uh, agreed with him without sort of because when you say enforced, it's like, well, who's enforcing this this monogamy? But <laughs> Um, but anyway, yeah, so you write that, you know, Heinrich, I guess it was that Heinrich at all makes a case in your paper, you say Heinrich at all make a case for monogamy's being an important civilizational, you know, adaptation. Can you explain uh, that and why, you know, monogamous societies are generally more positive than polygamous societies? Yeah, so, um, yeah, this is all just Jordan Peterson's point. Um, right. Well, sorry, the point Jordan Peterson was making, which was not even right. his point. Um, right. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I did actually a Google search uh, at the time I wrote this paper, and I restricted it just to. I, I said, look, let's let's restrict it to be just before Jordan Peterson made that comment because I didn't want that to distort anything. Right. And uh, it actually, I saw that there were 550 pu- publications using the phrase "enforced monogamy." And only 103 using the phrase normative monogamy. Yeah. So it seems, based on that, that right, yeah. forced monogamy is actually yeah. the more scholarly, uh, typical term. Uh, it's just, you know, normies weren't, you know, or nor, nor was I right. uh, aware of the term. And so it does come right, off right. like strongly. Right. Um, right. But yeah, so the Henrich point is like, uh, if I understand how this went down, Henrich was still at University of British Columbia at the time. And he was tapped to write an amicus curiae, uh, a friend of the court, because okay. yeah. Canada was considering legalizing polygamy. And, and he he came out against it. And then uh, his work there combined with um, uh, uh, Richardson and Boyd, uh, I think, um, um, he, they wrote this paper called The Puzzle of Monogamous Marriage. And uh, so the view is, and this is what what Peterson was riffing off of is is just that 
Um, monogamy is a stabilizing force in a culture uh, right. because it isn't as if, and this is something that, this is why I wrote this paper, to be frankly. I, I, wrote, I wrote this paper for philosophers more than the general public because okay. philosophers were wi are wildly uninformed about this issue. And so I was really, it was really for okay. that. Because, because, you know, the treatments of polygamy in the philosophical literature were, are very simplistic. I think they, you know, they're, they're approaching it from this like liberal perspective, which is like, hey, you know, if it's consensual and, you know, love is, you know, two people want to get together and get married, right. Right, why right, right. not three people and so forth. And they don't really, I think they're imagining, well, sometimes it'll be one man and multiple women, and sometimes it'll be one woman and multiple men, and sometimes it'll be one person, one person, you know, but, but what really happens in real life is that it becomes one man, multiple women, right? Poly uh, polygamy is, is the norm. Um, because again, of this hyper hypergamous aspect of female choice. So, so what, what, what goes on, what happens in polygamous societies, um, and what would probably happen even if you allowed polygamy, um, traditional societies don't allow, mo except for a few Himalayan societies, don't allow one woman, multiple men. But even if you let it, uh, even if you liberalized um, polygamy and allowed it to be, you know, to disregard the sex in question, um, you will end up with having about say 40% of men unattached. And this leads to, there's all, you know, there's sort of a lot of natural experiments and a lot of sociology that suggests that what, what happens is, is that these, these 40% of men are very unhappy about this, not having any sort of genetic legacy, right, right, not right, having right. sexual access except to prostitutes. And so they get more criminal, yeah. And they uh, work, they 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 buy into the culture less because there's no sort of benefit to them, you know, playing by the rules. They get more extreme in their politics, which all, all of this makes complete sense, right? Like if I'm if I'm in the bottom 40 percent of the male hierarchy, all I want to do is upset that hierarchy um, because who knows if I survive whatever civil war comes about um, yeah. I may end up in the top, you know, 50%. So let's go, let's get on. Cause I'm, you know, genetically I have nothing to lose, right? Either I die or I, you know, so, so like a, as the raps, as the rappers say, get rich or die trying. That's, that's, a, that's a, <laughs> that's a, that's a, right. That's that, that's that right. dynamic. And so, um, um, so it's, it's way more stabilizing to, um, restrict the number of wives that the top men can have it pushes right. all the other women down and the uh, and and right. then um and it seems like um it works it seems like that modern mono like our heritage of monogamy i always assumed it came from christianity but it, apparently not it apparently came from the greek city states yeah uh which it kind of makes sense that it would come from the same place that was also exploring democracy, right? I mean, right, what, right, what right. you have here is democracy is the sort of socialization of political power and what right. monogamy is a socialism of uh, a socialism of women. And so what, what's going on here is, is um, the competition between Greek city states may have been so fierce that they needed to squeeze out every drop of male initiative. And if you have like the top males being worried about the right. lower half of the males and spending a lot of their political and military right, 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 right. about those guys, um, right. it, that, that puts them at a disadvantage to their enemies. So what right. by giving by giving the by giving all men an opportunity to get married, you have those men being useful citizens. They have kids to take care of. They have a future in the state. They identify with the future yeah. of the state. And I'm hearing this more and more. I don't know if you've seen this meme, but there's this meme going on now in, among the incel right, which is um, um, something like no pussy, no work. I, I don't know <laughs> if you've seen this, but it's like no, no pussy, no work, which yeah. is exactly the this idea, right? Like like what, like if I'm not, if, if, if society is so arranged that I'm not um, getting a woman, then I'm just, I'm just tapping out. 
Um, I don't I don't have any buy. I have no skin in this game. I have no allegiances <sighs> to this group. And I'm just going to just be extractive. That's so, so silly, though, because think about how many like men, um, you know, weren't married, you know, Thomas Paine or, you know, how many like great men in history weren't. <laughs> that's yep, so silly. Uh, Newton, and so, Newton, right, right. Like, right. Right. Yeah. I can't uh, say I agree with that perspective. Uh, yeah, yeah, though, they could yeah. have. They could have. They were they were just probably kind of okay. autistic or whatever and or asexual or whatever. Um hmm. but but um I mean Newton was a really strange character. Yeah, know? he was. I think he Kant was. also Kant also uh, right. probably lived and died sexless and stuff like this. Um you got right. you got some of those super I, high IQ um you know dudes at that time that did kind of display that but um and that's setting aside like well or they may be you know crypto you know uh right. or something. Oh, but yeah yeah but yeah. um all that yeah we're talking true. about we're talking about guys who can't and that you're you're in a whole different world when you're you know just turning it down versus when you're mm -hmm. when you just can't so you, thought, you, you you're, you're not sympathetic with this idea that you think it's just an irrational response to no, I think that for some people it's not, but I, it's probably taken too far. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think it, I'm sure that if you, well, I, I don't know. You said you have to be careful about telling, you know, because you don't understand that person's situation, but probably getting off your computer and joining clubs or doing things or, you know, getting involved in, you know, civic pursuits or sports or all those things might allow you to meet people instead of just complaining on your computer each day, you know, again, but then I, I you know, and it's, I, but then again, I understand, I'm not, you know, I'm not male, you know, I'm not young. I wasn't put into this whole you know, dating dynamic as it exists today, which speaking of what you're saying that you think that sort of, well, two things, you wrote that the sexual economics theory and the advent of birth control marked a shift in human relations by detaching sex from reproduction, meaning that the mating market was bifurcated into one for recreational sex and another for marriage. And you say that you think the consequences of that are pretty dire and that today's sort of situation and mating practices are unsustainable to civilization. So what do you want to say quickly about that? Yeah, that's just on? that's just standard. Yeah. So none of that's like unique to me. That's just standard sexual economics theory kind of first laid out by uh, Roy, Roy Bomeister. Um, yeah. But um, and then there are some other interesting people in that space. Uh, like Mark Rig Rignaris. Um, but the idea is, yeah, so birth control, uh, b before birth control, there was one mating market. Um, that's the sex marriage market, right? <laughs> and and the birth control yeah. allowed women to detach that. So so right. they could, there's now a sex market, um, usually mostly in the 20s and then a marriage market later. And that, yeah, that changes everything because who you want to have sex with may not be the type of person that you want to marry. Um, and that's true for both men and women. Yeah. Um, but it also means that women are in the driver's seat when it comes to the sex market and men may, with the relationship market. And um, that what this is doing is kind of nurturing the type of qualities that we don't in, in, in the sex market nurtures a bunch of short term uh, mating type strategists, the CADs, as right. it were, in psychology. Right, 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 right. Um, they make out like bandits in for, with the girls in their 20s, but they're not marriage material. The, the guys who are more the dad type strategists, natural dad type strategists, are getting iced out in the 20s, which is, of course, when women are most desirable sexually. And, um, and they are just getting weirder and weirder, and they are more and more resentful and less and less willing to be dads and marry um, women yeah, at, yeah. at 32 when they wanted them at 22 they're like where were you at 22 um, when you wouldn't date me and so we're we're encouraging the wrong for civilizational speak civilizationally speaking we're encouraging the wrong sort of behaviors and wrong sort and actually benefiting the wrong sort of men um, and and anyway none of this really is particularly at all unique to me I'm just I'm just again trying to make uh, philosophers aware of this of this dynamic uh, yeah. So, yeah they don't spend their time on 4chan huh no, they don't. <laughs> they don't. 
<laughs> and and they're like often just wildly clueless about this stuff. And and right, if they're right, not right. clueless about it in the sense of if they're actually involved in the if they're say young philosophers, a lot of them just um are ideologically opposed to this sort of picture because it is uh, it is it acknowledges, I will say, I won't say assumes it acknowledges uh, you know, important sex differences. Um, it, it is it acknowledges a role for right. evolutionary psychology and stuff like that. Um, right. And, you know, they don't for for political and ideological reasons, they don't like that. So uh, I wanted that right. just to the, these sorts of ideas to start percolating inside the uh, philosophical community Good. more. Good. Real quick, let's end on something more positive before we jump to guns and self-defense. Um, you said that there is a course at Northwestern Marriage 101 which uh, sort of equips young people with sort of more common sense ideas about these types of things. What exactly do they teach there? Do you know offhand or I can no. link to it in the, I can link to it in the description. Yeah. Um, when I wrote this paper, I did, <laughs> but, but uh, okay. I, don't I, I worry about it. Then it. I can link to but it. Yeah. What yeah. I, what I, what I was trying to point to is some, yeah. Um, also um, I forget the name of this philosopher mm -hmm. out at Boston college, I think. Who, right. who who oh. also I forget her name maybe even that's okay we'll link to it well oh yeah yeah I'll but link to the course. she would even like give students extra credit for going on a date like a non-sexual date but um yeah so I think oh, I think nice. we need to start um you know how do you enforce monogamy I mean like that, that that's sort of the end of the end of the paper and I'm I don't say a lot about it but how do you go about it? Like, if you're asking Jordan Peterson, okay, how are you going to go about like enforcing monogamy? He doesn't think like we should just parcel out women to men at all. He doesn't think that. Right. Of course, uh, yes. But he thinks we need some sort of norms that sort of push uh, us to more monogamous, uh, not ju not just marriage, but sexual lifestyles. How do you do that? And of course, my liberal audience is going to not want anything that is is, you know, um, too coercive. Um, right. And so like, well, the first obvious step is just, well, what happens if we just educate people to this, right? Let's first just educate. And then maybe pe if people are educated to the, to the way that, um, you know, their behaviors are, you know, uh, what, what their behaviors are resulting in, they'll, they'll do them less often. That's probably naive, uh, because we probably have a collective action problem. It's, it's not the sort of situation where, um, like right. who's going to bell the cat, right? It, it's, if, if I'm the only one who, um, breaks away from this, um, negative, socially negative norm, uh, I'm not going to benefit from it. In fact, I'll actually suffer more from it, right? It, it, it needs everyone to buy into some degree. So, but at least, you know, like that's the first step is that we need to be educating. And I do try to gently bring that up in my classes. Uh, although my class is not very didactic about it. it's not like, you know, I don't right. try to just ram in my views at all. Uh, I just talk about this stuff literally the last week of class. But um, I do try to plant a seed that if they have eyes, they could see it and then start, you know, start making changes in that way. But I do think we need to be right now. The people who are talking about the people who are coming closest to, to talking about these things in the popular sphere are like, well, like a Jordan Peterson and, and, uh, or, and then they canceled him about it, you know, and he's, you know, he fights right. back, but, you know, then they go to the Andrew Tate's or something right. like that. But it's like there, we need more, we need more academics. We need more, and, and, and some are, but we need more academics who are willing to kind of talk about this stuff. Right. And, uh, because it's not just Jordan Peterson. He's not just making up. He's not crazy. And, oh um, yeah, sure. You know, well, you and, said there's demographic trends that sort of substantiate a lot of this stuff, so it's not. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, I think that's a given. Okay, well, very good. So let's move on to part two about the ethics of self-defense. You know, and I've written about this myself. Okay. Um. So it, yeah, you know, it interests me. Um. And this is talk about violence is another area where not with philosophers, but where just sort of the public at large, I really think there's a lot of really, there's not a lot of substantiative discourse, first of all. And second of all, there's just a lot of people say a lot of things that you can just tell they haven't really thought it through, or they're just doing it rhetorically. Like for one example, one example of this that drives me crazy is that people will say, oh, words are violence, speech is violence. 
Okay, I don't know if they're just doing that because it's rhetorically useful to conflate them or and maybe my idea is that maybe this is say it's not they're not just being rhetorical about it. I really think that at least in like the Western world where people are living in relatively safe environments, they've never experienced violence. They're arrogant enough to conflate that with words. Do you know what I mean? Or they've never had a violent situation and this informs their perspective on self-defense or what it's like to actually experience that, you know? So, so yeah, th there's that. And then, you know, we're gonna discuss your paper, Defense with Dignity, how dignity, the dignity of violent resistance informs the gun rights debate, among a few other things. And you're both, I think both of those papers of yours that I reference in the video are available on, is it philippapers.org? I'll, I'll cite them in the okay, description for the video. Yeah, um, I'll link to them. Uh, now, I really liked your argument in the paper because it uh, offers an argument for armed self-defense that perhaps both the left and the right can mm. accept. I hate the terms left and right, but you have mm. to use them to be understood nowadays. But, you know, but um, so anyway, so how do philosophers define dignity? Yeah, that's um, a very fraught term. Like, uh, I, I will say that the, 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 the biggest encyclopedia philosophy is the Stanford Encyclopedia Online, and it has a very good entry on dignity written by let me see written by uh who i don't know i don't know this person but um written by Re remy debs or remy debs anyway did a great job on it um and it does a, a uh, he d does a great job about talking about just how diffuse this word is so there's really just no agreement um it come, you know, people who come from more Kantian tradition seem to be interested in it. Uh, the English, more English liberal style is less interested in it. Um, uh, sometimes people who are like more Christian talk about it too, or mm -hmm. Christian Kantian type mashups. Yeah. But um, there's, there's one tradition that kind of just sees it as like this holiness but but without using the length the without using that religious right, idea right, 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 right. um but so it's like almost like a secular holiness coming from like it's like the secular replacement for being created in the image of god right i'm um, literally yeah. i mean like kant actually yeah, kind of does yeah. that and right, right, um, right, right, even right. calls it he yeah. even calls it like you know he even uses re religious terminology for that um and those people often try to take out the, there's also this sort of implicit sort of rankism in dignity. Um, if you, it, in the aristocratic traditions, it would have been assumed that someone has more dignity than another and that certain sort of behaviors are dignified or not depending on the social rank you have. So right. there's like this phrase, that, you know, doing this would be beneath my dignity. Right, right, right. But right. maybe not beneath your dignity if you're a street sweeper or something like that. Right. Um, right. So, like, Kant, like, didn't like that. He wanted to be egalitarian among all people because, again, he's just basically trying to, like, secularize Christianity in that way. Um, but uh, he makes these very strong distinctions between humans and animals, right? Because well, that's where the new hierarchy comes in. It's like, oh, right. we're higher than animals, okay? Um, but... Um, yeah, I in in this paper I try to I try to say look, I'm going to draw on your on like just first order intuition about whether this is dignified or not. I'm not that something where like your theory of dignity is not being relied upon. It's just like a direct right. a direct intuition about a particular case. And you have that all the time. So so like in philosophy, you know, if if um yeah, like like um um it is somehow like I, I don't need a, a grand theory of ethics to feel like I should pull a kid out of a shallow drowning in a shallow pond where all I have to right. use ground by the right. nape right. of the neck and pull. So, so, you know, that's what I'm doing here. For instance, like, uh, and this is the way I begin the paper. I talk about um, some Colorado, the, you know, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, I think, if I recall correctly, was 
resisting pressure from Republicans in the state to allow guns on campus. Mm -hmm. And they put up this, so they, they kind of put up this counter uh, strategy on their, on their uh, safety website saying that, well, you know, maybe if you're attacked on campus, you should try like um, urinating on yourself or or shitting on yourself. Oh, right? oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and so so like people like really responded negatively. Even feminists responded negatively. That who might not be big fans of gun rights. Because it's just so obviously, I, <laughs> like right, I don't yeah. need a big theory yeah. of indignity to say like this would right. be an undignified way to to um, respond to, to defend, violence. Defend yourself, yeah. Right. So yeah. So um, you know, like all all the my thought experiments and i have some fun ones in the paper but all my thought experiments are just trying to be like look this right. is, seems like an obvious case um so yeah right right and you say that we have a prima um prima facie right to defend our defend ourselves with dignity so yeah. uh can you ex quickly explain what that yeah. means? so um i think we ha for anything that you think we have a right to do whether it's work or um have sex or um, defend yourself, take any right. normal type thing. Um, you, you have a right not just to do that thing, but to do it in a dignified way. Right. Right. Um, and that doesn't mean that like, I'm, I'm not committing myself to like, someone has to pay for you to do that. And like, it, right. like, right. but right. if you have the resources to do it in a dignified way, um, you, um, have a right to do whatever that thing that you have a right to do in a dignified way. And, and, and so, um, this is yeah. not something that my all right. So there's like a there's like a Game of Thrones thing going on here. There's like a three way battle that I'm trying to create. Not traditionally in philosophy when it comes to guns or almost anything else. There's really no conservative position or right wing position. There's a libertarian position. That's the closest yeah. thing to it. And you have too many like right wingers or conservative philosophers like championing libertarian angles on things just because it's like they think it's the closest one. Um, so what I'm trying to do in this paper is articulate a genuinely kind of right wingish or conservative position that's distinct from the libertarians. The libertarians, it like right. true libertarians are not big fans of dignity talk. Right. Okay. And um, left wingers are fans of dignity talk. They bring it up a lot on their pet subjects. So disability right. or women's rights. And so what right. I try to do in the paper is keep right. saying, look, you think about, you know, like, here's an analogy with disability. Here's an al analogy with women's rights that you're feeling me on that. OK, well, just I'm just asking you to, you know, have the right. same sort of position when it comes to right. guns. Right. And well, so, that would be co consistent, wouldn't it? Yeah. So so so, you know, like in for many and, and I know one of my referees was uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know who one of the referees in the paper was, and he's a big left winger, um, but he is sensitive to that this type of argumentative strategy. So, um, um, yeah, that's uh, so. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing here. I think you have a right to defend yourself with dignity, even if okay. And this is where things get yeah. interesting, even if it means it's less effective. Than right. a non, you know, than than some other form that's undignified, and right. this is important because, like, the way the libertarians framed it, um, is that well, uh, I could only really defend guns if they actually make you safer, and then there, you know, then we get into all these empirical questions about whether guns make you safer. Right. And what I'm right. saying is, right. is right. you know right. what? What if guns don't even make you safer, but they allow you to defend yourself in a more dignified way? You may have a right to them anyway. You know, so right. like take right, take right, take right. disability. All right. So I'll just give one of my thought experiments in the paper. Right. Okay. All 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 of my all of my like left wing readers believe that like there should be ramps up to the courthouse so that people who are wheelchair bound can go up. You know, if they're paraplegic, they could go up. You know, right. to the courthouse. But you know, we could have easier. We could have like easier methods to go up the courthouse for them. I mean, it's hard to like wheel yourself up there, right? right. We could have just these right. big muscular bailiffs yeah. that lift you up, lift you yeah. up and kind of cradle yeah. you in their arms and take you in there and to, to, into the courthouse. Very convenient. You know, you could scroll on your phone and all sorts of stuff, right? But this goes would go over like a lead brick, <laughs> right? No, no, no one wants to hear this, right? That's because right. it's undignified. It would right? be it. Yeah. Okay. But harder, 
right? To to go, it's it's more dignified but harder to go up with a wheelchair. Likewise, right? Then, if um, even if even if self defense is not made more efficient by violent response, um, it doesn't make you safer. It doesn't realize your goal of emancipating yourself from an oppression oppressive re regime or whatever. Um, you still have a right to it if it's like the only way that you could do it in a dignified way or the most dignified way of doing it. Right. Okay. And does, yeah, so, no, so, so does this uh, now? What's your position on gun? Like, what you, you you said you wrote on guns? Like, what's your take on guns? Or well, I mean, I think that people have a right to self defense. But one of the things that I said was that part of the part of the misunderstanding is that really I think that sort of self defense of force should really be semantically distinct from the you know the word violence. And I think oh, I you can make a case for that. Well, yeah, I just put this as sort of an aside, you know, in one of the things that I've written. But part of the part of the issue is that people will use violence to mean any physical altercation. Now that's actually correct in English. However, I think if you look at the etymology of the word violence, you really could make a case that it sh it shouldn't be, you know, so overbroad because uh okay, so you have the the Latin root is violentia, meaning vehemence or impetuosity. And also in Old English, you know, violence meant physical force used to inflict uh, injury or damage. Do you know what I mean? So that implies aggression. And then if you look at the, the English definitions of it, that one is um, the use of physical force to harm someone, damage property, et cetera, exertion of physical force so as to injure or abuse, as in warfare you know, affecting or affecting illegal entry into a house, so on and so forth. An instance of violent treatment or procedure, injury as by distortion, infringement, outrage, and then to a great destructive force or energy, um, the violence the storm caused. And so um, some of these really imply aggressiveness, you know, as opposed to sort of the type of force you're using to defend yourself, you know, which really, you know, it's not to inflict illness or damage if you're defend. Well, maybe it's to inflict damage, but it's in response to violence. Do you know what I mean? So I, I don't know. I think that's sort of the overbroad use of the term. So for you, violence is what philosophers might call a moralized definition. Like you, you have a moralized yeah. definition. Like if, like, right. like murder versus killing. Murder is moralized. Right. Killing is right. not. For you, right. violence, right. violence connotes necessarily some sort of wrong. Right wrongful uh, right. violence I see, I see, I see. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think I had a non more I think I operate with a more non-moral right. license of violence. Right, word. and that's correct. It's correct, but I don't know if it, I, I think it, it's part of the, I don't know, maybe that's part of the reason that people tend to really conflate the two or just not people generally, not philosophers. But, um, but yeah, and in another, uh, in one of my papers, I'd written that um, just, sort of the irrationality of, of pacifism where it's, you know, there's sort of an, an elitism to, you know, strictly adhering to nonviolence when it, you know, as a, in a way to be non-harmful when actually if you don't defend people who are weaker than you or, you know, when there's a threat that actually results in harm. So it's paradoxical. But um, yeah, those are just some of the things I'd written about. I'm very but, sympathetic with that. Yeah, yeah. And there, I mean, there are some people who I've talked to who have a downright irrational views about um, violence and the proper response to it. I talked to someone who was like, oh, well, it's not, they are a Buddhist, but they're like, oh, it's not really proper to defend yourself. You know, and I, I think that's, that it's, even Gandhi, who is not a reasonable pacifist most of the time, I think he wrote in Doctrine of the Sword that, um, it, there, the only honorable course is self-defense if there's unreadiness for self-immolation. Basically saying if you're not a sage and you're not ready to die, you know, on behalf of your convictions, your pacifist convictions, then you should be defending yourself, you know, in some way. Interesting. Yeah, well, yeah, because I mean, yeah, I see, and I don't think most Westerners are sages. <laughs> some, maybe some of them, you know, but, uh, but anyway. Yeah, I think um, I, I'm against pacifism, not only yeah for consequentialist reasons that, uh, you know, like all the nice people would get eaten up by the bad people. Um, I think it is like even non-consequentially, like just I think we have obligations to um, 
defend ourselves um, and right. to to uh, you know not let not let um, bad people get away with what they're doing. Yeah. Right. Right. Absolutely. Um, so and you're yeah, right well, that we in, li, yeah. are, are in a particularly strange time that there's like increasing violence again. Uh, you know, you you may remember, I definitely do remember the, the peak of the crime wave in America in the late 80s, early 90s. I lived in Youngstown, Ohio, which right. had like, even though the town was only 50,000 people, like had like 80 murders or something like that in 89 or 90. Like oh, it, was, wow. it was bad out there. Um, and things have definitely gotten better, but they're getting worse since 2014 or so. Um, but it's kind of like weirdly localized in black communities and so forth in inner city. So you get like, right. you know, there's just right. all this weird, you know, you get some people want to come out down really hard on crime again. Um, then you have some people that are like defund the police and, and uh, you know, send the right. social workers yeah. in. We have yeah. so many weird views right now about, right. about how to respond to, um, to violent crime. It's really very right. interesting. It is. It is a weird climate. Um, yeah, but so let's discuss that then about, you know, arguments that someone might hold about protecting yourself from or positions someone might hold about protecting yourself from, you know, an attacker and how because some people will argue that, oh, well, you should think about your response, you know, and try to protect the attacker from disproportionate harm that results from their actions, you know, if they attack you they attack you first you know so there there was an interesting paper that you referenced it was on and by heidi hurd and the paper is stand your ground um i'll link to that in the description but she writes in defense of stand your ground laws the quote is of course you should be able to stand your ground when threatened with unjustified aggression to think otherwise is to subscribe to a view that you must forfeit your liberty to an assailant when doing so will be the means of saving his life. Um, it is to think that your rights end where others' wrongs begin. I really like that. Uh, very eloquent. <laughs> I couldn't have written it so eloquently. But and then it's then she goes on. It is to say that those who are otherwise in the right do wrong if they omit to take affirmative measures to protect those who are in the wrong. You know, while there may be circumstances in which one can thwart and aggressor's deadly intentions by fleeing the scene, you know, which I think obviously you should do that if you could, you know, um, forfeiting personal property, abandoning one's position or surrendering to indignities and other non deadly physical invasions. The suggestion that one must sacrifice rights to bodily integrity, freedom of movement or property when doing so will save the culpable aggressor's life is a suggestion that would be rejected by all who think people have rights at all. So yeah, I thought that was really well written. Yeah, that was, uh, I don't know how you heard, but that was a high T, highly thumotic, uh, <laughs> uh paragraph that I, I just wanted to quote in full in the footnotes. Um, yeah, uh, so uh, the definitely like people who like my paper are going to be probably already fans of standard ground castle doctrine type uh positions uh but there is like there is this worry i mean i, I i'm not like well you know you kind of uh bumped into me so now i could kill you type i mean there is like there there's right there right. is right um unnecessary force there is proportionality right. there are these things to worry about and uh in the last right. part of the paper, that's like kind of all I'm concerned about in dealing with objections is right. to, to these sorts of objections to third worries about third parties. OK, well, if I have to defend myself and well, sorry, if if to defend myself with dignity, um, I have to, uh, I have to or may use uh, a gun, then that may be putting third parties at risk, innocent third parties right. at risk. Right, 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 right. Um, and do I have any right to do that for the sake of my dignity? That's a really interesting question. And another interesting question is uh, more to what you're getting at here is, well, what about responsibilities to some sort of proportionality or not to go beyond what's necessary with respect to defense um, when it comes to the attacker? Like, is it really necessary if, 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 to, if, to, if to defend myself nonviolently 
but sorry, if to defend myself in an undignified way would be just as yeah. success, uh, just as successful or more yeah. than to defend myself in a dignified way, but that dignified way would be would impose more costs on my attacker. Then really, can I claim that it's necessary? Uh, am I not then visiting unnecessary right. amounts of violence on my attacker? So yeah, these are these are worries that I uh, take up in the last part right. paper. Right. Right. Yeah. And um, I just yeah. claim that um, yeah. So I I think that I think that um, what's what's necessary should be pegged to what is necessary to defend yourselves with dignity, not right. to defend yourself in some undignified way. Right. Um, but I do think that I do think that. Um, uh, what I don't defend in the paper is defending your dignity. I defend def what what I argue is that you can defend yeah. yourself with dignity. And so I think if like I have this case of like, well, suppose that a rapist is, is, is suppose like someone you know is going to try to rape you is is approaching you, but you're a marathon runner and you could easily outrun them. Right. Then I think that um, you know my my view doesn't say oh well you get to stand your ground and shoot them or something like that i think i think you 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 should run away from them um but that um um right um but uh you know that's different than castle doctrines and stuff like that um so right. um it, also there's these cases where and everyone kind of has this problem but like whether it's defense with dignity or defense with indignity um, of where if you don't do anything like so like suppose like you're dealing with a woman who is in a wheelchair and she's on a bus and some guy puts his hand down her shirt and is is fondling her breasts and she has reason to suppose that this isn't going to escalate further right, 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 and right, so right. forth and she has really only two options to like shoot the guy <laughs> right. or to or to just let it happen. Um, this, you know, even if you're not a defense with dignity person, right, it raises the, these interesting questions about, well, do you have to just suffer from uh, an assault? Right. Because the only way to stop the assault right. would be right. you might think it's disproportionate. Another another example right. is maybe. Um, let's say I'm a small boy being bullied by a big boy, and there's really no way I could effectively defend myself unless I bring a gun to school and shoot him. Um, right. You know, should should am I then justified in bringing a gun to school and shooting this boy? If given, you know, like supposing right. these are the right. two options, where all he's doing to me is kind of pantsing me, or you know, like wedging right, me, or right, throwing right, me in right, a locker right, right, a little right. bit, maybe not. So. Um, you know, those those are those are interesting questions there. Right. Um, and, you know, right. it's this is why I say, you know, like it's a prima facie. You have a prima facie right to dignified self-defense. But there could be some cases in yeah. which your right to self to dignified self-defense is maybe outweighed by some, you know, consequentialist consideration. Right. Right. And yeah, it's it's inter yeah, it's interesting. I think it, that the law actually takes proportionality into consideration in many cases. Do you know what I mean? Like you can get in a lot of trouble if you kill someone and it turns out you're a martial artist, even if they attack you first. Do you know what I mean? Like it turns out that, you know, you know, you, you know how to like really defend yourself well and things like that. There's a lot of instances where the law, I really think, takes proportionality into a into consideration already, you know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, not always, of course, you know, things could always be improved or changed. But yeah, there was a, just this incident that happened. I don't really know anything about it. I haven't followed it closely, but this whole subway incident that just happened, someone, yes. yeah, someone attacked someone else. And yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it really comes down to what what the law says. But I don't know, then you, you have other time, other things where people will say, Oh, well, it was just it was just a property crime. You know, when someone comes in with a gun and they're like, oh, it's just a property crime. But how do you know in the heat of the moment whether it's a property crime or not, whether this person isn't, if they're holding you at gunpoint or something, or especially as a female, you know what I mean? If somebody is holding you at gunpoint and they're just there to rob you, how do you know they're not there to rape you as well or kill you as well? You know, there's a lot of really interesting things that or, well, it's not interesting if you're involved in it, but, you know, difficult questions surrounding these things. But um, yeah, this there's this phrase that 
that you hear online about like they you know like th they valued their property more than your life or some or more than life or like life is more important right. than property which is like the a wrong way to approach it like i mean if if the argument is like you are not an imminent threat of grave bodily injury right um, right because right. this this person is trying to steal your garden right. though Okay, right. or they're outside. Yeah, they're yeah, outside your home. That, your home, you know. Yeah. You know, that's the language that I right. definitely will understand. Um, but the way that it's being framed is like someone right. could put you in a in a situation where, or like like, well, you shouldn't right. stop looters. You shouldn't stop looters with potentially deadly force because the stuff in that target is less important than a human life. So it's like the, the way they're the way they're wielding it is to say, like, you can't even you don't have a right to stop with the threat of deadly force. Right. Um, someone from doing a property crime, which just then just means that you cannot stop people from doing property crimes. Um, right. You know, because. Um, right. That's true. You know, so so. Um, which is nuts in my right. view and, and leading right. to, you know, this is why Walmart's pulling out of Portland. This is why right. Um, right. all these places right. are pulling out now of even, I forget what the most recent stores are pulling out of San Francisco. Cause they, you know, these insane They're not enforcing um, property crimes. Yeah. Them. Anti, uh, anti, um, the, these right. laws against shoplifters. Right. Well, but when it comes to some sort of violent situation, it all depends on the, the particulars of the interaction. Do you know what I mean? And a lot of that is completely disregarded where you have someone who is engaged in a felony who ended up being shot. Do you know what I mean? Or, you know, harmed in some way. And it all depends on like the, the particulars of the situation and the law, you know, but just if someone's engaged in a felony and then harm results from that situation, you, you really have to ask you know, well, why were they committing a felony or a vi especially a violent felony? You know what I mean? Depending on what was happening. But yeah, it, it does also depend on the situation too. But I don't, the way that people approach a lot of things is, uh, I don't know, it's kind of inconsistent too sometimes. Yeah, we're, we're really exploring some interesting, like the, the level of social breakdown is so grave now that like, yeah. Our laws weren't even written for the type of brazenness that we have. Um, so, yeah. you know, it's like it I think our laws are written for, OK, a guy breaks into a target and then you're like, hey, get out of here. <laughs> you know, and then he goes because he's like, you know, afraid of the law or, you know, afraid of getting arrested or, you know, shamed out right. of it, you know. Um, but now it's just like, well, I'm just going to keep coming into the target and me and my, you know, a hundred people that just arrange something online to do so. And, um, there's really no, no stopping us unless you shoot one of us. Um, right. and so it's like, yeah, this is a kind of terror incognita of, of like social breakdown. We've, we've allowed things to go so far that we, we right. really do need to, to think harder about um about you know the what's going on here is it just about protecting property or is it about social order is it about you know maintaining a safe space um where you know that, that a, a place that's not yeah. lawless and yeah. things like that that um where you know like so you get you know with the with the blm rights in 2020 you had people just going on people's lawns and like yeah. burning effigies and and having effigies on like like um, police chief's lawns. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and yeah, so, yeah. so for the first time I was, you know, people are asking this question, wait, so if somebody is like coming to spray paint my house, can I stop them? Uh, can right. I stop them physically? Um, but wait, if I'm, if I, you know, is this deadly force? Am I, you know, am I attacking them if they're just trying to spray paint my house? Like who would ever thought right. this before? Like if you're trying to spray paint right, your house right, and someone right, else, right. you run away. Right. But now it's like, no, they're not going to run away. <laughs> so uh, now am I, am I as physically assaulting this guy because he's spray painting my house and now like I'm the right. aggressor? Like what right. is going on? This is very, right. very interesting. No, well, that's tough. It kind of depends on the jurisdiction you live in. In New Jersey, there's duty to retreat. Uh -huh. So if if you were to shoot someone in that situation, you would completely be at fault. You know, if the long as they're outside your house, you know what mm -hmm. I mean? If they come into your house, that's a different story. But I mean, it really depends on the jurisdiction and what the law is, too. Yeah. And when the law mm -hmm. does and when the law is depolicing, 
uh, and uninterested right. in, in getting involved in that sort of stuff um, right, because the right, police are right. disgusted. And, and so, yeah, we are, we are in very, we're, we're going to see some very interesting things happen in this country in the next uh, 10 years for sure. I hope for a soft landing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. All right. Well, I don't say that. Oh, God. I just, uh, yeah, but, um, but I, I was hoping to end on a more positive note. But, but yeah, thank you anyway, Dan, for coming on. Well, thank you, um, Leah, for having me. Yeah, this me. has been, yeah, this has been great. And, um, yeah, thanks for taking the time. Good, good. I hope we uh, talk uh, sometime in the future. Okay, yeah, excellent. Thank you. Let me figure out how to stop the recording.